Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, archivist of the United States. Whether you're here in the William G. McGowan Theater or joining us on our YouTube station, welcome to our discussion of African American life in Washington, D.C. before emancipation. We're proud to present this program in partnership with the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the D.C. Commission on African American Affairs, and the D.C. Commission on Emancipation. Before we go any further, I want to extend a very special welcome to a remarkable woman in our audience. Virginia McLaurin is with us a month after celebrating her 107th birthday. In February, she became an internet dance sensation when she, when she paid a visit to President and Mrs. Barack Obama at the White House. For more than 20 years, Grandma Virginia, Virginia a longtime district resident, as, as she is known, has been a foster grandmother to city youth. Cheryl Christmas, the director, project director for Foster Grandparent Program United Planning Organization, will now say a few words. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Well, Grandma and I just enjoyed the, all of the wonders here in the National Archives, and we are just so proud to be a part of the showing of this, this exhibit. I just wanted to just take a couple of moments. A lot of you know about Grandma, um, and we were talking about the history, um, which I'm sure this exhibit is going to talk about. Uh, we have a program under the Corporation for National Community Services and where we provide volunteer opportunities for some 200 seniors. I will tell you that the thing that bonds all of these seniors and grandma is the need for education of the children. As we look through history, we see that the only way that you break the ties of poverty, oppression, and all the things that we have as African Americans experience is through opportunities of education. It starts early. I call them, um, they're the, out of the war on poverty. They're my soldiers. They come out on buses, on foot, on, uh, in cars, every day like grandma. She volunteers 40 hours a week at Roots Public Charter working in pre-K classrooms. We work with educators on how we can help children to learn better. We were honored to be a part of this. I just wanted to share with you a little bit about our program. So whether you support us here or wherever it is that you're from, foster grandparents and how we make history is we connect the past with the present onto the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. We're also pleased to have Secretary of the District of Columbia, Lauren Vaughn, with us. The Secretary oversees several offices, one of which is the Office of Public Record and Archives. Please welcome Secretary Vaughn. Good evening. Uh, uh, as previously stated, I'm Lauren Vaughn, Secretary of the District of Columbia, and I'm delighted to be here to bring greetings from Mayor Muriel Bowser. Uh, I want to thank John Franklin uh, from the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture for including me in this, and I also want to thank uh, Mr. Ferrier, uh, the Archivist of the United States, for hosting this event here at the National Archives. As you all know, Emancipation Day commemorates and celebrates that historic day when President Abraham Lincoln signed the Compensated Emancipation Act on April 16, 1862, freeing 3,185 enslaved people of African descent in the District of Columbia eight and a half months prior to his signing of the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st in 1863. This year marks the 154th anniversary of that important day that started the end of slavery in America. As the Secretary of the District of Columbia, there are many uh, functions in my portfolio, including the Office of Public Records and the DC Archives. And uh, I am also charged with the planning and execution of the city's activities to commemorate and celebrate 
Emancipation Day. This year, our theme is a vision toward full democracy for the residents of the District of Columbia. And on Friday, Mayor Bowser will host the first Full Democracy Champions Breakfast at the Willard Hotel, where she will convene a panel of uh, civil and voting rights experts to examine the path from slavery to emancipation with a vision toward full democracy. Then on Saturday, April 16th, the city will host the DC Emancipation Day Parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, beginning at 7th Street. I invite you to come and join Mayor Bowser and the council and DC public schools and community groups and residents and others to walk in the Emancipation Day Parade. It begins at one o'clock. If, like, uh, if you would like to walk in the parade, it's not too late, please visit our website and register at emancipation.dc.gov. I also want to mention that for the first time ever, we will present a float in the Emancipation Day Parade that was built by Phelps Ace High School students in collaboration with the Hill Center at the Old Naval Hospital and the Executive Office of the Mayor. The float was inspired by the events of April 16, 1862. Um, following the parade, the district will host the Emancipation Day Truck Touch in the 1300 block of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, last year was the first time that Mayor Bowser, um, that the truck touch uh, was um, at the parade and the kids absolutely loved it, but grownups like it too. So I encourage you to come and, and have some fun. Uh, after the parade, we will have the Emancipation Day concert for the rest of the afternoon right there on Freedom Plaza. The, all of these activities are free and open to the public. Uh, and the evening will conclude with a fireworks display at 13th and Pennsylvania. I want to thank you again for coming out this evening, and I hope that you all will join us for a weekend of fun and family-friendly activities. Thank you very much. And here's a little tip if you're um, planning to come to the parade. The best place to watch the parade is from our steps on Constitution Avenue because the parade starts there. <laughs> and now I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up later this month in the McGowan Theater. On Thursday, April 24th at 7, 21st at 7, we'll show the documentary film Eye on the 60s, the icon iconic photography of Roland Sherman. Filmmaker Chris Guido will be joined by Edith Lee Payne, who was the subject of one of Sherman's most famous images taken at the March on Washington when she was 12 years old. The following week on Wednesday, April 27th at 7 p.m., Lee Hamilton, former U.S. representative, will talk about his recent book, Congress, Presidents, and American Politics, 50 Years of Writings and Reflections. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as online at archives.gov. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby where you can receive that calendar by regular mail or email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our work in education and outreach, and there are applications for membership in the lobby also. And a little-known secret, which I keep telling everyone, is no one has ever been turned down for membership in the Archives Foundation. <laughs> From the earliest days of the District of Columbia, slavery existed in the nation's capital. In the 19th century, Washington was home to one of the most active slave depots in the country, which anti-slavery activists decried as a disgrace to the nation. The passage of, DC, of the D.C. Emancipation Act of April 16, 1862, created a large body of records that helped us piece together a picture of the lives of enslaved people in Washington, D.C., these records, now in the National Archives, include manumission papers, emancipation papers, compensation petitions by slaveholders, affidavits of freedom, and habeas corpus case records. They offer us a window onto the lives of slaveholders, slaves, and free blacks in closely defined territory and preserved valuable personal and historical information for future generations. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists. Our moderator is John W. Franklin, Senior Manager for External Affairs at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Joining him is Dr. Mark, Mark Oslander, Professor of Anthropology at Central Washington University. 
Dr. Maurice Jackson, Professor of History at Georgetown University, and Dr. Nancy Burkov, the Mary Elliott and Mary Elliott, both curators at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Good evening, and thank you, David. Um, I've learned tonight that indeed this is the tenth year that we've had a program on DC emancipation. We began at the National Museum of American History and then it closed. And your predecessor, David Allen Weinstein, courteously invited us to use the National Archives for the program as long as we needed it. Now the National Museum of African American History and Culture is opening in September, but we hope to maintain this partnership <laughs> with you. I've just been in Richmond where, indeed, Richmond has designed a slave trail. And you can go from the river and look at different signs. And there's a map with the locations all the way down to the different pens in Sh Shaco Bottom where the internal slave trade took place in Richmond. I remind you that this was not always our national capital, that Washington was preceded by Philadelphia and New York. And the decision was made in the late 1790s, as you see from the map on the upper left-hand corner, to create a federal city where there were plantations in Southern Maryland. So slavery in this space precedes the creation of Washington. You can't see it clearly, but in the center of the map is a circle, which is Jenkins Hill which becomes Capitol Hill. And what we have on the map are the names of the plantations and the names of the owners, men and women, who own the plantations from Mount Pleasant at the top of the map to Duddington Pasture, which is where we're seated now. I mention women because two of the plantations on the right are owned by Widow Wheeler and Widow Young. Women inherited the land of their husbands. They came with property. They came with slaves. And so this, is, this anchors us into the past of this space. The map on the right is from 1836. From a broadside, from a poster that you'll see later in the presentation, called Slave Mart of America, published by the Anti-Slavery Society in 1836 in New York. And it identifies the location down here at the bottom of Neal's prison, one of the two slave pens in this neighborhood. We are, where we are seated was the central market. And around us were many activities involving the slave trade. Seventh Street led to the river and to where the ships came in, bringing Africans off the ships to these slave pens. It's always been a concern of mine that the, most of the signage in the city says civil war to civil rights and misses this early period. So I've been agitating, surprise, <laughs> for proper signage. And within this year, you will see signage at the corner of 7th and Independence. One sign called Slavery in DC with a quote from President Lincoln, who arrives here from Illinois and can see the slave pens from his office. So it's a quote from Lincoln. And the second sign is a sign that says slave pens in DC, in Washington, DC. And it has a quote from Solomon Northup, who indeed was imprisoned there and describes it in his best-selling book that's published in 1853 when he's released. But he describes it of 1841 <coughs> when he's captured and made a slave in this city. I wanted my colleagues, before we begin the formal presentations, to talk a little bit more about this neighborhood. Mary. Um, when I think of this neighborhood, I had to do some research on uh, the colonization, American Colonization Society. And I think what was powerful for me was um, understanding, particularly where we are doing the slavery and freedom exhibition. 
um, there's emphasis on the fact that this is not just a story of slavery, but it's a story of slavery and freedom. And the thought of slavery and freedom, freedom in particular, before emancipation, and how that was viewed through many different lenses. And so I think of this particular space because it's my understanding that right where we have the National Council of Negro Women, the building here at 7th and Pennsylvania Avenue, there was a hotel connected to that building. And that was a hotel where some of the meetings to discuss the colonization society, the development, finally producing the colonization society um, took place. And the American Colonization Society brought together a cross-section of people who had different views on slavery and freedom, particularly looking at free people of color and saying that they cannot live in a white society. And so looking at where that freedom needed to be manifested. And so that's what I think about with this space. It's such an interesting idea of here's unfolding right at that space, the idea of thinking through freedom but also right here, all of the activity going on with slavery. So that's what comes to mind to me for this particular area. That's it. Well, to build on what Mary's saying, I think that, um, and also what you said about from civil war to civil rights, that really those, la those histories are so layered within this particular space. So that, you know, we think of our nation as really creating, you know, this land of freedom, but that it was built and so permeated with slavery. And whenever I hear you describe the city, I'm just struck by the fact that this was ordinary, this was normal, that people walked around this space without really thinking about it. We talk about the anti-slavery messages, but we also know that the majority of the people who are creating and running our nation's government were somehow comfortable with slavery. But then on the other hand, to build on what Mary was saying about both slavery and freedom, we also know that there were freedom movements and freedom struggles that began long before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And so this space is also occupied with that. And just a final note is that I'm so struck and always just I don't know the proper word to use, overwhelmed by the fact that all of this history has been erased and that we need everyone up here to recite it for us over and over again and that it just disappears and slips through our fingers each time. Mark. One of the things we see on the map is, uh, is the Washington Canal, which entered where Watergate is now. That's why we call it Watergate. And of course, was a, a, an important sort of artery of commerce in the city. And if we think about the history of capitalism in, in, in this region, uh, at a time when there was an enormous, as we'll hear, an enormous sort of crisis in agricultural production in the mid-Atlantic states, and where, quite horrifically, the breeding of enslaved people, the selling of them further south, and so forth, became part of the economic motor, that canal was extremely important. And it's not coincidental, as we'll talk about, that we're seeing uh, a, a number of the key slave pens and sale sites uh, uh, close by the, uh, uh, you know, close by the canal. But the canal itself is is covered up. Although of course the new museum has discovered uh, the amount of under underground water that's uh, yes, we associated have. with all that. Uh, and that's just so that that sort of literal covering up. I think is a very nice example of what we've just heard about. That we walk every day uh, 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 over this this deep, enormously painful history where fantastic fortunes were made uh, on the backs of both enslaved and exploited uh, free persons of color who we'll be hearing about this evening. Now, if you notice on the map, on the, well, you can't actually see it. On the map on the left, in the upper left-hand corner, is Georgetown. My wife Karen and I were looking at a map in my father's library of the United States in 1776. And of course, not only does Washington not exist, many places that we now associate that this area do not exist. But Georgetown was there as a community. And that's where our colleague Maurice works. So Maurice, tell us about your neighborhood. Well, before I do, I'm just a lady that grandma is here. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, we just had a big event at Georgetown celebrating uh, a uh, uh, the republishing of a book, Black Georgetown Remembered. So I have my only copy, and I would just like to leave this with you. And I'm sure many of the people you may, you may well know. So I'll give it to Miss Christmas. Thank you, Murray. Uh, thank you, and 
Thank Grandma. Grandma, you're an inspiration to many young people. They should come out to events like, like you do. <laughs> Hello. So, 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 well, uh, I'll talk a bit about Georgetown. Uh, I should tell you that the president of the university uh, 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 sort of uh, got with the program. As many universities throughout the country started uh, looking at the way the universities were built, and uh, many, in fact, built off the profits of, of, of slavery. So some of the scholars have been studying, students have been protesting, but nobody demanded anything uh, of the president in this sense. So uh, on his own, out of, he's a scholar, he decided that he would uh, establish a commission, a body to study uh, a slave in Georgetown. And the body has just now uh, been formed. I left brochures out here where everyone uh, can find them. Uh, the simple fact is that uh, the Jesuits of uh, 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 Maryland owned uh, any number of slaves. Around the Georgetown area, 272 uh, 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 of those lived, farming 12,000 acres of land. Uh, Father uh, uh, Mulde, uh, over time, saw uh, the struggle for, uh, for emancipation coming. Uh, in 1835, there were 127 uh, abolition societies in, in Washington. In 1835, the Pinckney, 1836-37, the Pinckney gag order was passed. And that gag order stopped all discussion. So the, uh, so, so the gentleman uh, uh, of the Jesuit order saw the uh, writing on the wall. Uh, they feared that emancipation may come, so they decided to sell the slaves. And the slaves were sold uh, down south. We don't exactly know uh, where. Uh, the slaves were sold. Uh, our total, I think, they got about $15,000. We don't know. Uh, we do know in, 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 in modern day now, if it were computed, uh, it could go up to $20 million, uh, 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 the value of the slaves, in fact, uh, 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 sold. So as I speak a, a little bit more, uh, I'll, uh, I'll show a, a brief uh, PowerPoint and I'll talk about that. You can begin with it. Oh. And, you have oh. click. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, oh, I better get mine wh wh where I can see it. I can't see that. What? There's one ahead of you. Huh? There's one straight model right ahead of you. <laughs> you can't see it for. But, but I can figure out. So, 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 if you look at the numbers here, what you can see is uh, I, I have my in the back back there. Oh, here it is. I, I have it here. Forgive me, Ham. So, so it, it, as you can see uh, uh, there, you can see the now amount of uh, uh, slaves that are in Washington, D.C. At, uh, at its founding. Uh, uh, George Washington, uh, before uh, Johnny told you th uh, uh, that they decided to settle it here with the name George, quite frankly, it's, it's quite simple. The North and the South were trying to figure out where the capital was. The, the revolutionaries went to, uh, to Philadelphia uh, 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 to meet. The pensioners did not get their pension. They went to Philadelphia to get their pensions. The, the revolution didn't want to pay them. They ran them to New York. Uh, then they followed them to New York. So, so, so the, uh, 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 the founders decided we had to get to a place with no population. And that was uh, where we are now. Uh, George Washington said something very interesting. The time is now near at hand, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be freemen or slaves, to conquer or to die. But when he said that, he said it with no meaning of, of for African Americans. So you can see the way uh, other cities settled. And you can look at the charts there, uh, the numbers. Uh, 1,800, 14,000 population, but 783 are free and th 3,000 slaves. And over a period of time, you can see the chart and you can see how it developed. Uh, very soon, uh, there were rumblings. Uh, somebody uh, and you can see there, that is called a coffle. And these coffles were actually going up and down the street. Abraham Lincoln saw such a coffle in 1847. He's only, he's only two years in Congress. When he saw that, uh, he tried to get the, DC, the people of D.C. to pass a bill against slavery. They wouldn't. And he said, and I left the matter alone. Because remember, he was just here uh, uh, for a short period of time. Uh, here are some of the places where slavery uh, 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 existed. And this is a pretty good fa uh, uh, facsimile of a, of a slave or quarter. You can see her there. They live in a, a sometimes a little uh, uh, place in the back. Over a period of time, over years, uh, Many of you all know about the development of alleys uh, and alley life uh, in Washington, but they often lived in accommodations behind uh, the master's house. Many who were free uh, and going their freedom worked as craftsmen, and others worked as, uh, it wasn't slavery as we know in the fields. It would have been more of a domestic uh, 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 slavery, but slavery nonetheless. Uh, many of the slaves uh, 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 were maybe a generation or so uh, uh, from Africa. At the beginning, we found that about 20% of the population was black. Uh, many lived in Georgetown. As you know, uh, the city has, uh, when it's founded, there's uh, Washington City, there's Georgetown, uh, uh, there's Washington County. 
and, 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 and Washington is formed by 100 miles square. 100 miles, to make it simple, 100 square mile, you know what that is. 100 square miles square, you square every mile. And so it comes up to about 100, uh, uh, 10 square miles mile square. So it comes up to about 100 uh, square miles all, all over. And it's a relatively small. 69 miles come from uh, uh, Maryland. 31 come from uh, uh, Virginia. And so uh, 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 the capital is, is situated right in a slave uh, uh, place. Half of the blacks, all blacks in the country at the time the nation's capital is formed, live in Maryland and live in, uh, live in uh, 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 Virginia. Uh, a free black community develops over a period of time. And this is one man, Yerl Mahmoud. Uh, some of you all have followed this man in the paper. Uh, or, or you know about his site. He owned the house. He bought a house in 1810 on Dent Place uh, uh, in Georgetown, the city now working to excavate it. Uh, he, he was born around 1736, got his freedom at about 1796, uh, bought a house about uh, 10 years uh, later. Uh, he saved up once or twice. He saved up once to buy the house, and then somebody uh, flim flam out of the money the bank did, and, and he was able to buy another. And so set an example. This a painting by Charles Peel. This painting here, uh, this paint, uh, the other painting by Charles Peel, this uh, uh, painting by uh, a man uh, from Georgetown who discovered uh, this, if you go into Georgetown Library, somehow it got messed up. But this is by Alexander Simpson, who had been an a, 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 a art, art teacher at Georgetown, this one, and other than by uh, uh, Peel. Uh, this is the site in Georgetown where uh, they are now excavating it. And this is James Johnson, who wrote a book of, uh, 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 from slavery to Harvard about uh, the experience of this man uh, in, in Georgetown. These are some of the excavations of that uh, a place. This uh, is Georgetown. This is... Uh, uh, this is a, 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 a slave marriage license. You see, uh, slavery and, and churches are very, very interesting. If, if you know the words of, of uh, the Battle of the Republic, John Brown's body, he fought to make men holy, but he could not make men free. In the Civil Rights Movement, they changed the words, he fought to make men holy, let us fight to make men free. But actually, the first meaning uh, uh, means more. And so the Catholic Church, like many churches, they would want to make people holy because to make a person holy meant that they themselves would not go to hell. So they were not making them holy for the slaves, but making them holy for themselves. Uh, 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 uh. And so uh, uh, they would often uh, uh, take the church, uh, the slaves' the church, they would marry, uh, 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 not live in sin per se, but never grant them uh, uh, freedom. And many of these slave marriages licenses are held at Trinity Church there uh, 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 in Georgetown. Here's a, 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 a deed of sale for the first slaves that were actually uh, uh, sold down. Uh, here is some of the sites, and I don't have pictures of it, but I'll go through it uh, very quickly in Georgetown, where slavery existed. Uh, 3041 Volta Place, the house still exists. Harriet Beecher Stowe in, in, in Uncle Tom's cabin uh, had a wonderful line. She said, men came to Washington, uh, the men to the tavern, the slaves to the jail. And what she meant was that the men would go upstairs, uh, 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 a drink, tie their slaves downstairs in, in, the, bo uh, in the bottom. You saw that. If you go to Virginia now, you go to Franklin Armstead, where... Uh, of the National Urban League, where the Urban League headquarters is, you can actually go downstairs and see where the slaves. And there are many, many. McCandles Tavern at the corner of Wisconsin and M Street. Uh, Souter's uh, Tavern, owned by John Souter, and he was the leader of the Board of Trade. McCandles Tavern at the corner of Wisconsin and M Street. The best way to figure out where this is is when you go get your Apple computer fixed and just look across the street, and there it is, uh, 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 right there where these uh, 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 slave uh, 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 taverns were held. And so slavery existed in Georgetown along with uh, existing at, uh, at the university. It also existed as far up as the National Zoo. And this is uh, Holt House, was the house which uh, has not been torn down uh, not so long ago. And here slaves uh, were there before the uh, 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 National Zoo. This is now Smithsonian property. Now the Smithsonian's uh, property. And this, I have the name wrong, but it's Franklin and, and, and Armfield. And this was the key leading slave uh, trader in America uh, at the time. They had offices in different places. You see, when we say slavery, uh, Washington was a leading slave uh, uh, port, it did not mean we had more slaves. It means they sold them here. And so the slaves would often be transported in and out, Union Station, other places we are told about. And this place was, uh, was the leading place with an office uh, in Georgetown. Remember now, Alexandria at that time is a part of uh, Virginia. Uh, in Washington, something else uh, forced the, uh, 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 the Jesuits uh, uh, to sell the slaves. And that is the beginning of the abolitionist movement I spoke about, but the rumblings. And African Americans had something called the Epicurean Society, which is the eating and drinking society, the talking society. And there they would meet. And there one night, uh, 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 this uh, young man, Arthur Bowen, a very young man, 
uh, 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 who's owned by Mrs. Thornton. Mrs. Thornton's husband, Thornton, was the architect of the, uh, of, uh, of the Capitol. He came home one night uh, uh, a bit inebriated. Uh, he knocked over a stick. Uh, Mrs. Thornton thought somebody broke into the house. She started screaming. Uh, Bowen uh, ran out. The neighbors soon came up and descended upon the house. But who was one of the neighbors? Francis Scott Key. And Francis Scott Key was Sue. He was the district attorney. So he tried the case uh, there. Of course, uh, his brother-in-law is Roger Taney. Roger Taney uh, uh, with the Dred Scott decision. I often wonder why presidents, including President Obama and others, uh, 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 swear, uh, 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 when they swear uh, the oath, they swear it on, uh, on this Bible. Uh, many presidents, uh, it, it's beyond me. Uh, but they bring the Bible out, I guess you swear on what you, but, but, but most presidents have sworn uh, on, that, on, on, that, on that Bible. For some reason, I don't, maybe it's historic. Well, it is historic, but for, for the wrong reason. Uh, then, then, so, so there was the, the flow of this riot. Now, when this happened, a, a, a white man uh, throughout the Navy Yard uh, started uh, rioting, and they, and they went and, 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 and they uh, found this man, uh, 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 found this man, uh, uh, Arthur Bowen. But this created a, 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 a big mixture and a big commotion in Washington, D.C. But something else happened. And a man named Reuben Campbell, and Reuben Campbell was the brother of Prudence Campbell. Prudence Campbell had been a northern uh, 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 abolition and started schools uh, uh, there. He was a man who wasn't, he, he had some anti-slavery literature in his house. Well, soon as th that happened, Francis Scott Key assumed that he was somehow tied in with the Epicurean Society. He knew nothing of them. He just had some literature. Understand Washington, D.C. Is, is, is 1835, 36, 37 becomes the center of abolitionism in many ways, be mainly because of Congress. Many people come in, the abolition societies come and meet here. Uh, uh, other people like uh, Garris and others come, but they go to uh, Baltimore and, and work. And so here's a, a bit of what is happening around the time that Georgetown sells the slaves. So Georgetown is not setting the slaves out of interest of the, of, of the university, outside of getting some money, but it's selling because it knows, in my opinion, that slavery will, will soon uh, 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 come to an end. Lastly, as we speak of Lincoln, uh, uh, he said uh, uh, when he came some years ago, if whites could see the black men of the colored infantry uh, marching and, 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 and skirmishing on Roosevelt and Andalusian Island, if they could see that, the war would end in a day. Uh, when, uh, because he uh, uh, did not want to first muster blacks. Later on, he did uh, 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 muster blacks. Uh, and in, I, I can only come back to the words of, uh, of Frederick Douglass about Washington, D.C. I hailed uh, when D.C. emancipation, as we were told, was passed uh, uh, nine months before. And what he said, Douglass, is only he could say, I hail the emancipation of Washington, D.C. as the doom of slavery in all the states. I hail it as the end of all that miserable statementships, which for 60 years juggled and deceived the people by professing to reconcile what is irreconcilable. He later wrote that the Mackle Proclamation was not only a staggering blow to slavery throughout the country, but a killing blow to rebellion and the end, beginning of the end to both. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mark, when I was, I started working at the Smithsonian in 87, and I was reading Constance Green's Secret, Secret City, which talks about the history of African Americans in Washington, D.C. I was born here, but I left very young, and now I'm working at the Smithsonian, and I want to learn more about the city. And so I'm in Norfolk, and I come to the part of the book in the 1830s where they're talking about the slave markets in the city across from where the Smithsonian would be built. Now, you remember Smithson bequest gives this $500,000 in gold for the creation of an institution in Washington for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And you know where the Smithsonian Castle sits. Well, you see how close that is to the slave pens that we've been discussing in the area. And Mark has been working on this period of the early part of the Smithsonian. Tell us about it, Mark. Yeah, thanks. First of all, it's, a, it's an, uh, an honor to be in the presence of Grandma Virginia. And it's also an honor to be, to, to be at the National Archives, uh, where so, much of, so many of us have worked uh, so long. And I, of course, the holdings are extraordinary, as we heard. But I, I do think it's important tonight to acknowledge the extraordinary archival staff and historians that have tirelessly worked um, with hundreds of historians and other scholars uh, to illuminate various aspects of the history of slavery, especially in the district. 
uh, people like Robert Ellis, who worked so hard to illuminate uh, the court records and the financial records that we have here, uh, that cast a whole new light and uh, become quite important for thinking about institutions like the Smithsonian and other aspects of the federal government. There's a wonderful quote, uh, uh, some of you will know, uh, by Theodore Dwight Weld, uh, the great abolitionist uh, activist, when, when he's here, uh, he's writing back to his wife, the great Angelique Gribke, uh, in 1842, he's in the district precisely uh, to take on the gag rule. He's bringing all the, the famous anti-slavery petitions, uh, he's defending John Quincy Adams, he's trying to break the gag rule and being held uh, basically to trial in the House of Representatives. And he has this line, because he's talking about the role of enslaved and, and also free messengers uh, who link together uh, all these federal offices. And he has this great line, who but a slaveholder in laying out the plan of the national buildings would have dreamed of locating all the departments and offices of the government in which are employed at least 1,000 clerks and so forth. And it, it reminds us what, what makes the district so interesting. There are many parallels in the stories that we're talking about tonight, of course, with stories of, of, of enslavement and of freedom th throughout the United States. But there's some particularly interesting things about the, uh, uh, about the Smithsonian, uh, which I've been fascinated by, and I'm trying to finish up a, a book on African-American experiences in slavery and freedom at, at the Smithsonian Institution. We get a sense of the, of the city here. Here we see the... Canal, and you can just see uh, the Smithsonian Castle Building, which, as, as John has said, uh, it was located directly across from the infamous Yellow House. Uh, you've just seen this map. Uh, we get a sense of these. And um, uh, Jefferson Davis, who was one of the founding members of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian, uh, defended the Yellow House, said, you know, it's the house by which all of us must go who wish to reach the building of the Smithsonian Institute. He uh, didn't think it, it, was, it looked so bad from the inside, uh, although many people, of course, report the screams and so forth that did come from within it. Uh, so it's important to remember how central the institution of slavery is. Uh, one of the things I look at, actually, is the story of the bequest, uh, where Smithson gets his money from. It's a, another story we'll, we'll get into. Sugar. Obviously, obviously, the Atlantic slave trade is, uh, uh, is an important part of the story. Uh, but as we move on, uh, uh, to, and it's important to remember that the very day, of course, of Lincoln's inauguration, as we can see, there's a slave sale that's being announced. Uh, uh, even though supposedly the Compromise of 1850 had ended uh, the sale of enslaved people within the district, we, we know that sales uh, took place and, and often moving people to Alexandria. Uh, 1848, the year the construction begins on the Smithsonian building, what we now call the Castle Building, saw the, the greatest mass escape of enslaved people, uh, the Pearl. Uh, and those stories, the stories of those families are just extraordinary and are very important to think of the long story of self-liberation and self-emancipation before the Compensated Emancipation Bill that we celebrate tonight. Uh, we do know that the sandstone of the castle, we were just talking about this, uh, uh, it's long been reported. When I first worked at, in the castle building many, many years ago when I was in college, uh, many older African-American guards were called uh, uh, although it was contrary to the, quote, documentary record, that the, uh, the red sandstone out of which the Smithsonian building was constructed had been quarried by enslaved people. And it turns out, thanks to records we've been able to find uh, here in the National Archives uh, and elsewhere, uh, that that is well uh, substantiated. Uh, John Peter, who was the uh, great-grandson of Martha Custis Washington, uh, was able to underbid uh, other uh, quarry owners uh, in, in so that the con relevant congressional committee uh, then uh, arranges for the uh, ironically entitled Freestone to come down to come down uh, the Seattle Canal now then through the Washington Canal uh, uh, and for the construction of the Smithsonian Castle Building between 1848 and the early 1850s and uh, we have been able to identify thanks to a series of uh, sort of lucky or horrific historical accidents uh, the names of many of those enslaved people uh, who match up, it turns out, quite well. I won't go into the very detailed stories, but Washington is full of these extremely complex histories of enslaved people who are moving themselves around, uh, who have free relations, who are, uh, in many cases, uh, working hard to purchase freedom of loved ones, uh, but are also making very tough decisions about when to do that. And these kinds of charts give us a sense of the different strategies Good. as people are being inherited and moved around and so forth. Uh, coming into from Mount Vernon and uh, some of the other uh, Washington and Custis uh, plantations, 
into Georgetown, and some of them eventually being sent up to uh, uh, Upper Montgomery County uh, doing agricultural work and so forth. The general pattern, as many of you know, uh, of enslaved uh, labor within the district, it's closely tied with what's going on in Montgomery County and, and, and Prince George's County. Uh, and that means especially uh, men are moving around a lot, doing agricultural work and other kinds of activities. Uh, women are somewhat more bound to location, though not entirely. So we have many cases of enslaved people within this, the Peters network moving back and forth between Georgetown, Henley Town, uh, Upper Montgomery County, and so forth. And that's an important part of the story. Some of them are uh, objects of great complex suits, which is how we know a lot about them, especially in court records. Uh, here, right here in this building. And we can match up quite clearly the story of many of those enslaved uh, families with uh, the George Washington 1799 uh, census for Mount Vernon. And we can actually trace over the course of half a century uh, the actual names and individuals. Some of them come in uh, to uh, Georgetown uh, uh, and are sold away by the Peter family after the death of, uh, uh, after uh, certain deaths within the larger Washington uh, and Custis uh, clan, as it were, uh, and we can trace uh, the families that are broken up. And that's, of course, a story we do want to remember tonight. Uh, uh, not all families were sold together. We have many cases, as you can see here, of children, of young children, some as ages four, being, being sold off in order partly to pay for the construction of Tudor Place, which is one of the most magnificent uh, structures of the city. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, it is, and some, of course, are escaping, are self-liberating, getting, in some cases, get to Pennsylvania. Uh, but uh, as we latch up these various names, I, we won't have time to go through this, sorry, but um, we do get a sense of uh, uh, the very precarious lives that many enslaved people are, are doing. When I did travel out, though, to the, to the, the church out in Seneca, uh, and my wife and I attended uh, uh, a worship service there. It was very interesting that the, the, the stories uh, and the pride of a sense in that uh, African American congregation that has historical roots going back 175 years do endure. So there is that strong connection to, uh, uh, to the Smithsonian, uh, which is very proud there. And recently, Jeanette Cole welcomed uh, all the children from the Sunday school uh, there to, to welcome them to, to their institution uh, for all of the ironies and tragedies and so forth. But the Smithsonian is also has a very fascinating antebellum history of, um, uh, of, 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 uh, of free people of color. Uh, uh, the most famous of them, of course, is Solomon Brown, who works uh, from 1852 uh, into the 20th century, uh, in a, a vast range of jobs, an extraordinary talented person. But there are also important uh, other free persons uh, of color, including James Gant, who's one of, who had been uh, the chief chef. He'd first been in the White House, then he was in the Navy Yard. Then he's at the National Institute, which is the museum that then gets transferred uh, to the Smithsonian uh, soon after its formal establishment. Because the Smithsonian wasn't initially so much a museum as it was conceived of, uh, at least by Joseph Henry, its first secretary, as an advanced research institute. And he didn't really like the idea of, uh, of, of a museum. Uh, but, uh, uh, but James Gant comes in and is a great defender of the museum, as is Solomon Brown. They're closely allied, it turns out, very complex politics. Uh, at the Smithsonian uh, in the mid-century, uh, mid-19th century period between uh, those who want to see it as a pure scientific institution, those who want to see it as, uh, as something that's really de de dedicated to mass communication. Uh, and, uh, and that is directly maps on to the struggle between John C. Calhoun and uh, John Quincy Adams over the slavery question and over wh what the, whether or not the Smithsonian bequest should be developed. So that's all swirling around. And we have extraordinarily rich letters uh, by, uh, by Solomon Brown, uh, who's very well known, but who nonetheless, after the passage of the, uh, 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 after the so-called 1850 Compromise and the passage of the, uh, uh, of the Fugitive uh, Slave uh, Act, uh, is himself imperiled, as well known as he is, and he feels compelled, as we can see in the course of the 1850s, to get new freedom papers and so forth. So even the most established uh, uh, figures, he, you know, he's a prominent intellectual in many senses, becomes quite important later in, in, the, 50, in the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. He's very close, working with the Grimkeys very closely on a, on a wide range of cases. But uh, up until uh, the 1862 Emancipation Act, he, it's clear he feels quite imperiled. Uh, but that doesn't stop him from essentially being a kind of, uh, I'm sorry, intelligence service 
closely working with Spencer Baird. He's trying to save the collection. There are a number of cases in which Joseph Henry is trying to sort of shut down the, uh, uh, shut down the museum part uh, and, uh, and somehow various uh, key congressional figures are notified and write to Joseph Henry about, isn't it wonderful you have such a terrific museum? And we now know uh, from the correspondence that it's Solomon Brown who is, who is sort of guiding information in very fascinating ways. Uh, uh, even though there's a, a lot of tension uh, that comes through in this correspondence. Uh, 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 and it's also quite fascinating during uh, when uh, Jubal Early, the, the Confederate general, of course, crosses the Potomac, comes through Maryland. It's widely believed in July 1864 that the, that the District of Columbia may fall to the Confederacy. Uh, the white staff has cleared out of the Smithsonian. The African-American staff remains behind. And uh, Solomon Brown, uh, who had been charged with the protection of important objects in the National Museum collection, uh, arranges to bury them uh, underneath the South uh, Tower and is ready to de defend. So, so that's an interesting little uh, aspect of the history of, of the institution. And it just reminds us, I think, of the, of, of the very fraught and complex position of uh, free African Americans during the period of slavery. Uh, uh, because he's also uh, serving to advise and in some cases help, help fund um, uh, friends and relations who are, who are trying to purchase uh, people. And, and I think that's one of the richest things about the compensated emancipation uh, documents as, as we work uh, through them, that we see a number of cases in which it, uh, compensation is being sought by uh, free people of color for their own uh, spouses, their children, and so forth, who they've partially been able to liberate, and so forth. And I'll just end with this one wonderful story that speaks to the history of uh, the school where I went to, Sidwell Friends, which was built on uh, high, the Highlands Plantation. Uh, and uh, there's a group of enslaved people all associated with the nurse family, the, a senior official in the Treasury Department, uh, as is the land of the National Cathedral. And, uh, and uh, in the compensated emancipation documents, we see William Brooks, who had uh, himself been purchased uh, 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 by Joseph Nurse uh, as a child, as about a five-year-old child, many years earlier, uh, from uh, within Georgetown uh, into the uh, residence that's now Dumbarton House, uh, and then ends up uh, up in the Mount Auburn area. Uh, and he's free, and he is seeking compensated emancipation for his wife, Rachel, and their five children uh, in 1862. Uh, but it's interesting, Rachel has clearly thought of herself as free for a while, because you can see in the documents uh, uh, that she has initially written down her name as the, as the co-owner of her children, and then the clerk has forced her to cross it out, because technically she's not free yet, although she's conceived of herself as a free, as a free woman, and is actually listed in the 1860 census. Uh, and she has to sort of redefine herself precisely for the purpose uh, that the family can, can get a little bit of money to set up their own household. Uh, and these are the sort of complex ironies that we, that we continue to ponder. So you see why I asked Maurice and Mark to talk about these respective institutions that we think we know, but the history is so complex and so deep behind. Wow, now, how is the National Museum of African American History and Culture going to present this complex history of slavery and freedom in the museum that opens in September? Nancy and Mary? <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> well, Mary and I are co-curating the exhibition on slavery and freedom, and we always present together, which means that we really, really present together like we finish each other's sentences. And, but tonight we're trying to actually divide up our duties. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to begin. So. What we're going to do today is um, to share some of the, first of all, the overarching goals of the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition, mm -hmm. and then to share some of our objects, and more importantly, the stories that those objects tell, and then to talk a little bit about the philosophy for community collecting. So how as a museum do we get outside those four walls and actually reach out to the community and bring community in? But first of all, since we're in DC, we wanted to talk about the museum and the power of place. Um, the fact that really 
this history, the history of slavery and freedom has not been marked on the landscape. It's marked within our minds based on knowledge, based on customs, based on habits, but it's not been physically marked in Washington, D.C. So slavery throughout our country and really throughout most of the world has been rendered invisible, even though I would say we would say that the world that we live in today is the product of this form of slavery. So people might encounter slavery in school, they might encounter it, slavery in a textbook, but it's really absent from our public places. So what does it mean to finally create a building where slavery is going to have a very prominent place within it? Um, we really want to emphasize the fact that you know, when I say that slavery has been rendered invisible, it's been very difficult for us to even acquire the collections in order to make this exhibition. That all of the objects related to slavery have been tucked away, uh, destroyed, kind of rendered invisible. So what our museum will be doing is creating this museum with a very public place that will start to bring these objects back in view. And I think that this is really important, that the Smithsonian's always known for displaying the real thing. And by displaying slavery and freedom, people will be unable to walk away from that indisputable fact that this thing happened. So this exhibition will be placed um, within our museum, which is in that little shaded location that you can see right there on the National Mall. So I think this is very important that we're actually bringing this history back to this place. Uh, our museum is joining that long group of Smithsonian museums that you see on this map right here. And if you think of most of those museums and the stories they tell, um, they often are buildings that are like those buildings on the top there. Those are our national buildings, it's the Capitol and the White House, and you can see that they're usually classical buildings um, and with lots of columns and with lots of steps. And our museum is instead hearkening back to an African and an African-American past in its design and in its structure. And as importantly, when you come to our museum, when you walk up to it, there are no steps involved. You simply walk into the first floor of the museum. There'll be doors on all four sides. So it's a very welcoming place to encourage all visitors to come in. So it's not an intimidating building. So Mary and I are working on one of three history galleries, and that's the Slavery and Freedom Gallery. All of the history galleries in our museum are 45,000 square feet. I always have to like actually read that to make sure that that's true, because that is just an awesome amount of space devoted to African American history. Um, our, our exhibit is on the first floor, so people will enter into our space, which is 18,000 square feet that is devoted to telling the history of slavery from 15th century Africa all the way up through the Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction. Um, so the themes that we, you know, it's pretty awesome, pretty daunting project to try to take that history. And even if you do have 18,000 square feet, how do you actually tell this story? So we. Uh, decided that we were really going to focus on three principal themes. First of all, that slavery is America's story. That slavery was everywhere within the United States. It was north, it was south, it was east, it was west. And that slavery was foundational to the building of our nation. And we can see that just based on the discussion that we've had about Washington, D.C. and the power of slavery within it. We also look at the fact that slavery is always side by side with freedom, that the two are inextricably linked. They're inextricably linked in our government, in our economy, but also in people's lives. And we also are always emphasizing the fact that we're viewing slavery through the African American lens. So how do you take slavery and freedom and only view it from that perspective? So you're telling the American story, you're telling a shared story, but you're telling it through the lens of the African-American experience. So, um, 
Oh, I see the slides have kind of taken off on their own. We do run into this problem with this show. <laughs> <laughs> so at our museum, not only will you see history on those three floors where you're really seeing the, the entire history of the nation, but um, you'll also can encounter on the upper floors in the arts floor, in community, and in cultural, you encounter these same topics through the lens of music, through the lens of sports, through the lens of fine art. So the museum is going to be a living museum where you can encounter these same themes and these same issues in very many different ways. So when most people, what, we looked at other exhibitions and, and thought about how other people exhibited slavery, and you really see three principal tactics. When you go to many exhibitions on slavery, people focus on the institution of slavery. Those are the exhibits where you go in and you see a lot of hoes, you see a lot of plows, you see work, you see equipment, you see institutions, you see big houses, you see slave quarters. Other exhibitions focus on brutality and the horrors of slavery, and so that's another common tactic. And the third is that people focus on um, resistance. And what we decided is that we wanted to really look at the complexity of the institution of slavery, not to privilege one of those things, but to hold all of them together, to really view this through the lens of the African-American experience and focus on how people retained and also really emphasized their humanity within this institution. And that means that all of those things come into play. So we move from this typical picture where you usually see the big house and we zoom in. And what we're doing is looking at this institution from the perspective of the people who lived through it. So this is a picture that's been broken down that would now with digital photography, you can actually zoom in and see these amazing images of people within that image that ordinarily people would just see the big house. But instead, we're looking at it from the perspective of those who lived and worked within that environment. So what we're looking at is um, really emphasizing that African people with African knowledges transformed landscapes such as this. This is a gigantic cypress swamp that you would have encountered in most of America along the riverways. They transformed this vast cypress swamp into workable agricultural fields that really financed the making of America and built many of the structures, including the Smithsonian, the White House, and the Capitol. So how do we unpack that? What we decided we wanted to do is to not turn away from the violence, not turn away from the love and the joy, not turn away from the brutality of the work, and not turn away from the pride that people took within their work. So what we do is we try to focus the exhibition on three beats. So first of all, we focus on the individual. So I'll just take this one man, Solomon Williams, as an example. Solomon Williams was a blacksmith in Natchitoches, Louisiana. He was a master blacksmith who was enslaved. And Solomon Williams constructed this amazing drill bit. This drill bit is literally almost four feet tall. And it's a double helix drill bit that he constructed out of iron, and it took amazing mathematical precision to come up with the mathematical formulas to have all of those curves meet in that particular place. So we look at how lives um, and people's, we really look at the three beats of life, work, and enslavement. And so this is how we examine people's work. And that work wasn't just about enslavement, it was also about skill. Solomon Williams also used those same skills to create this grave marker that he constructed for his wife, Laid Williams, so that people within the institution of slavery, that slavery was not just about work, but slavery was also about family. And so he used those same skills and those same talents to honor a loved one. And we want to make sure that that's woven throughout the exhibit. And finally, we also look at the brutality of enslavement itself, that Solomon Williams also would have been forced to make restraints such as this one that you see here. 
so that all of these things are different aspects of his lives. And we try to hold them all in balance and hold them open with the contradictions that are really embedded within them. So that's just a general overview of some of the themes that we try to hit throughout the show. And now Mir is going to talk more about the objects, which is always exciting. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I'll give you a disclaimer. There's a part in here where we show quite a few objects, and it'll loop through pretty quickly. I'm going to allow it to loop through, and then I'll expound a little bit more on the objects. So the power of objects, you've heard um, from Nancy some of the wonderful information about the museum itself and about the exhibition. Um, one of the things that I think you probably noticed in Nancy's presentation is that juxtaposition of profit and power with the human cost and how we really try and humanize this story of slavery and freedom. And when we say humanize and we talk about the story of slavery and freedom, we mean everybody, it's very inclusive. So that goes from the enslaved African, African American, to the slaveholder, as well as to a crew member on a slave ship. We want everyone to see themselves in, these, in this exhibit so they can really understand what was going on in the world at that time. One of the things that's very important is, of course, it's always wonderful to talk about some of these larger themes through what would seemingly be a mundane object. Um, the idea of two different people coming together looking at an object in a case and having different perspectives and engaging in conversation. And that conversation can evolve into discussions about community, about the nation, even about race. Here you see an image that is taken from an earlier exhibition that Nancy was one of the co-curators on, and that was um, the, the Changing America exhibition. And the Changing America exhibition, and please excuse me, I'm going to let these loop through. Let's see if I can go back. Do you want me to do the slide? Yeah, if you don't mind. So the Changing America exhibition, you'll see in the um, Top in the corner to the left, there is Harriet Tubman's shawl, and right below that is Nat Turner's Bible. And then we can let it loop through, and I'll just say, this is the Lobby Amulet, will be, be featured in the Middle Passage section. Next, we have the Fox Wages book, which is a wages book from the crew members on the Fox slave ship. We have the Prince Simbo powder horn, which is a powder horn that was owned by a black patriot during the Revolutionary War. This is Peter Benson's silver teapot produced by the, one of the few blacksmiths in um, the United States, a free African-American man, or he was actually originally from St. Croix That's right. and was between St. Croix and Philadelphia. That's one of our first objects. We have a slave dealer's business card This is an image of a young girl who is uh, enslaved, taking care of her charge, a young white child. And then we have the handheld Emancipation Proclamation. So if we pause right there, the objects that you just saw, again, like I said, they are seemingly mundane objects. But they're very powerful in that they tell the story of the making of the nation. And they tell very personal stories about Harriet Tubman and this beautiful, ornate shawl that she wore. About Nat Turner and this Bible that he held that he preached to both whites and blacks. And he had this insight to pursue freedom. And we were fortunate enough to get this Bible knowing that it was originally owned by one of the white families that actually had an ancestor who was killed in the insurrection that was led by Nat Turner. The Lobi amulet was an amulet that was used by a member of the Lobi tribe. It was used to protect them from being placed into the slave trade. And it really gives us the story of resistance and resilience and the early slave trade period. The Fox Wages book is a wages book from the Fox slave ship, which gives us insight into crew members who actually served on these slave ships, who made choices, made moral choices, whether to engage in this slave trade, whether it was for 
money to take care of their family, <coughs> passage to the new world, or just for profit. Prince Simbo's powder horn is very important because it tells us the story of freedom by any means necessary, and that you had early on <coughs> Africans in uh, colonial North America who chose to fight for freedom, choosing either side as a patriot or a loyalist. Peter Benson's teapot really gives us the story of the free communities of color. And Peter Benson, the fluidity of his moving between the Caribbean and Philadelphia, <coughs> and his role as a free person during this period of slavery. The slave dealer's business card is a very powerful reminder that, in fact, this slave trade was a business. And it does show us the story of profit and power and that this business was no different than anything else, and people would hand out these cards in the process of selling humans. And the image of the young enslaved woman who was actually charged with taking care of this young lady, it's the idea of seeing this young woman and knowing that African Americans, profit was made from their bodies and from their labor, and that they still were human, just like anyone else, yet they were charged to take care of others in their enslavement. And then the handheld Emancipation Proclamation was carried by Union soldiers to share the news that, in fact, freedom had come. So we're fortunate to have those objects. Now, I, go through those, I went through those objects rather quickly because really what I'd like to share with you are some of the objects that we don't have on this slideshow, but they are very relevant to this story. That includes, we have a slave ship manifest from Franklin and Armfield, um, which were one of the largest slave dealing companies here, and they were based out of Alexandria, Virginia. We also have um, American Colonization Society and membership papers, and of course the American Colonization Society was formed including with members including Francis Scott Key to send free African Americans beyond the shores of of North America back to Africa because it was believed that many of these free African Americans would incite um, rebellions and cause strife in white society. We also have um, a story on petitions where you see African Americans petitioning for freedom after this Revolutionary War period. And then we also have freedom papers owned by a gentleman named Joseph Trammell. Those freedom papers we received from his descendants he was based out of Loudoun County, Virginia, and he created a handheld tin to carry those freedom papers to hold tight his freedom and ensure that he would not be enslaved during this period before emancipation came. Let me go to the next slide. So in addition to the objects, we go outside beyond the walls of the museum, and we have to reach out to local communities. So Nancy and I actually just came back from travels. Nancy just came back from South Africa, and I came back from St. Croix. Nancy is working on a project with Brown University, and I'll let her expound on that, talking about the transatlantic slave trade. And I'm working with a colleague on um, the slave wrecks project, looking at slave wrecks in the waters outside of St. Croix. But this object you see on the screen is the slave cabin. It is an antebellum period slave cabin that we were able to secure from the Edisto Island Historic Preservation Society. The Preservation Society reached out to us and they knew that we were looking for a slave cabin and they were generous enough to offer this cabin to us. But it wasn't enough for us to just get this slave cabin and put it on display. We needed to find the story about slavery in this site in Edisto Island, South Carolina. We partnered with a young lady, Tony Carrier, who is over Low Country Africana, and she was able to not only assist us while we did research on the cabin to authenticate it, but also to look at, at connecting with the descendants of the enslaved community as well as the descendants of the slaveholding community. What you see is an image of some of the descendants of the enslaved associated with this particular plantation, the Point and Pines Plantation. This was a very powerful, um, event when we went down to dismantle the slave cabin. It took about a week. Nancy was down there before I was and she got flooded with all the media. But what was so powerful beyond all the, the interviews and the cameras was really more powerfully the interactions with the community members. 
It was the conversations with the community members. It was the discussion about the history of slavery in that place and about the legacy of history. But even more powerful than that was every day the people who came to see this cabin be dismantled were, again, the descendants of the enslaved and the slaveholding families. There were organic conversations, and we were able to make inroads with local churches and to have focus groups with church members. And while we met with church members from the historically black church, white community members came and engaged in those discussions. It was very powerful. And we found some people who actually discussed their being related to each other, black and white together, <coughs> which is not surprising, but it was just powerful to see it in that space. There was a young lady there who recounted, um, we asked her to speak for us in her Gullah dialect, and she spoke in the Gullah dialect and remembered the voice of her great-grandmother as she explained that the cabin was going to be moved to Washington, D.C., but the most powerful thing she said was, as she said she channeled her great-grandmother, was that they found us. They found us. They know that we were here. And now everyone will know that we were here as they take this cabin to Washington. The descendants of the slaveholding family invited us to dinner at their home. And we went to their home and we talked very frankly about going from segregation to integration. We talked very frankly about what it was like to inherit this legacy. And we talked very frankly about what community means. And we did this again across section of races, ages, gender. That's what these objects do, right? So what's very important is community goes beyond just people of African descent or just people who are not of African descent. It's everybody. This picture you see here is the crew and myself, Nancy, and the descendants hey, and folks of the Edisto Island Historic Preservation Society. I will tell you one last thing about this experience. The gentleman who is standing in the window with our colleague, Fleur Pesor. His name is Mr. Megan. Mm -hmm. And we had a point where there were so many people coming down and interviewing folks. So Mr. Megan allowed us to interview him. He was a little bit, um, he was kind of like a curmudgeon, right? <laughs> but he was really, you know, he, at the end of the day, he, was, he loved the whole experience. And he looks forward to when we continue, as we continue to go down. So the crew members were made up of white, Latino, um, I don't think there were any African American members of the crew, and even um, one Native American person, person of American Indian descent. So we asked them if they would um, quiet down while we interviewed Mr. Megid. And Mr. Megid, what you should know about these cabins is they were occupied until the 1980s. No running water, no electricity, right? Mr. Meggett lived in those cabins in the 1930s, I think yeah. it is. So we asked him, well, what was that like? And he, you know, he was pretty... He used some colorful language. Yes. <laughs> he didn't mix his words. But one of the things that happened was the crew members, they were quiet, and they kind of, they were like, you know, at the beginning of this process, they were like, why does this even matter? What's going on here? But they were doing they their job. Said, why are they spending so much money on that old house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were doing, they did a fabulous job, they did a fabulous job, but when they were hushed to do, for this interview, Mr. Meggett talked about how his mother made his underwear out of rice bags, and he talked about how they ate out in the yard and cooked out in the yard, and afterwards, all of the men on the crew, you could see that they were just moved by this story. One of the gentlemen the next day came up to me. And I told Nancy, um, he stopped me, and he said, you know, I just want you to know that you can tell that the multitudes are here right now, that the multitudes are here right now. And it was based on this energy that was going through this entire process. So all the objects you see, you'll see these objects. They'll be behind glass, but they are very powerful. And I hope everyone keeps that in mind to know that this is all of our story, right? It's everybody's story. So just going through, I want to share with you that, and if we go to the next slide, that we extend our reach again beyond these walls. So we've been at Edisto Island in South Carolina. 
We had the good fortune of working with the folks down in Cane River, Louisiana, which they helped us with the story on Solomon Williams. Um, we've worked with Faith Congregational Church in Connecticut, and Nancy can expound on that. And then we are very thrilled that we will be able to feature some early objects um, from Africa, and that is having worked with some of our colleagues from IFON down in, um, in Senegal, um, in West Africa. And so we're really thrilled about that. The story starts before the 15th century and goes all the way through 1876 just for our exhibit alone. And we continue to do outreach through the Slave Shipwrecks Project and efforts of Nancy working on a collaborative on the transatlantic slave trade story. I think the next slide. We're going to need to open this for questions. Yeah. And if you have questions, please go to the mics in the aisles. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. The panel should be commended for such a fine presentation, <clears throat> but there are two pieces that are missing for me. Daniel Alexander Payne reports in his Reflections of 70 Years about his role as an advocate for the emancipation of blacks in Washington. And Constance also puts that up in The Secret City, you know, that there was something of a community that was going on between the freed blacks and the enslaved blacks. And you can see this with Alethea Tanner and what she did at Metropolitan AME. But there seemed to have been not only a cohesion in the black community that was based on community and compassion, but also that people had the ability to stand up and speak for themselves as their own advocates, as, as Frederick Douglass is a perfect example. Can you talk about those dimensions for me, please? Well, I can say we have a section in the exhibit on the free communities of color. And I won't tell you the quote, but we have an extremely powerful quote that expounds on the connections between free blacks and enslaved blacks, right? And we do show the um, collaborative effort of free and enslaved, and we also talk about the spaces where they lived and how that enabled them to communicate um, whether it's in an urban setting or even in some of these rural settings. So that is how we speak to some of that in the story of free communities of color. And Nancy, I'm sure there's some more that you could share. And as principally, it was interesting that you mentioned the churches because it definitely comes out in the churches. And we feature two churches on uh, either end of the exhibition, and that definitely comes up within it. Mm -hmm. And if I may add, Joseph Henry, of course, as the first secretary, denies Frederick Douglass the opportunity to speak at the institution yeah. for a debate on <clears throat> emancipation. Well, could, could I just add? As Please. The, the story also goes a little deeper, John, because I understand mm -hmm. that, that Douglass was invited to speak at the castle, and to keep him from speaking, they refigured the whole, well, there used to be an auditorium in the castle, and I was told that was taken out. That's, right. That's absolutely yeah. right, yeah. So, all pub so uh, because of the invitation to Frederick Douglass as part of this Civil War period a lecture series, uh, all public lectures at the Smithsonian were suspended uh, uh, during uh, the life of Joseph Henry. It's not until he, he passes in 1878 and Spencer Baird, his number two, who, who was essentially an abolitionist, becomes the, uh, the new secretary of the public lectures series restored, which is why uh, just down the road at the Natural History Museum, we have the Spencer Baird Auditorium. So, uh, but I mean, I think the point is just profound that was just made, that, uh, that uh, uh, there are very complex and important uh, alliances. I mean, there are also points of division, unquestionably, including class-based within, with, within the African-American population in the district. But, uh, but the overwhelming tendency, I think you're right, is that uh, is one of self, gradual self-liberation and, and extremely sophisticated political activism. Frederick Douglass may be the most public voice, but there are hundreds of people who are putting their lives on, their li on the line. And it gets even more complicated when so-called contraband, once, once other self-liberated people come across the Potomac into the city during the war. But all of that's been building for, for, for a long time. And it's really historically wrong to simply see the Compensated Emancipation Bill as, as sort of a gift that's coming down solely from Congress. It, it is being forced in various ways through precisely the alliances that you're mentioning. The next question, please. Yes, I'm um, waiting anxiously to see the museum in September and to experience the power that you just spoke about. And so I'd like to understand how that power really is conveyed if it's behind glass. Are you 
complementing it with technology or those stories? Have you recorded those? Have you posted them? Can you give us some sense of how that happens? Um, we recorded, we actually recorded the young lady who um, spoke in Gullah. And um, you will be able to see that. There is a, um, a documentary that's being put together now. Um, Great Museums is doing a piece on the museum itself. And they were down there filming that particular event. So you will see part of that. And um, we are using technology to expound a little bit more on some of these stories. But you'll also see some of this power through design. We, um, we're very thoughtful about design, and I think you'll be very surprised how we have the designed the space in ways that I know other museums have done wonderful jobs, but I'm really proud of what we've done with our design team to really make you stop and think about this, these subjects. Um, we have a, a, a feature which will look at early legislation and African-American voices speaking back to this legislation. So, so one of the things we encountered early on was people said, well, you can't really find you know, first person voices so early, particularly during that transatlantic slave trade period. And you won't really find many voices um, speaking to legislation. But we did. And we found some fabulous quotes <laughs> that I think will resonate with people. And it's the way we have designed these quotes to be presented, that it's not just a blip on the screen. And so we it may sound odd, but you'll see when you get in how we've designed it so it really does stand out. Yeah, and to, I really agree with what Mary was saying. All along the way, we really encountered resistance where people said that this material just didn't exist, but we dug and dug and dug. And I think it's the first person that is always, always privileged within the exhibition. That it's really the concept of holding on to humanity. And so that means focusing on individuals, focusing on the wholeness of an individual life. And so one of the technologies that we're actually using is the voice. Mm -hmm. So we're actually having people read. Actors are working on that right now. Um, to read some of these first person accounts so that you can get the feeling of the human vo voice. And you know, this is not an easy topic to work on, as you all can imagine. It, but after a while, the one thing that really, uh, that really got to me was when I heard those actors reading. Mm -hmm. And we, just one last thing, we have, um, we're looking at an oral history project to um, record some of the oral history, histories of the donors who donated very personal objects of their descendants. <coughs> Oh, and one other thing. They might be objects behind glass, but I really believe in the power of the object. Yeah. So our objects are living things. Like, what happened with that cabin? That is a presence. And I really think that even with these objects behind glass, they speak to you. That they are there, they are present, they cannot be denied. And so I don't think, you know, seeing an image of an object does you the same good. They, these objects have a power. Mm -hmm. Question here, please. Uh, yes, um, I, I'm just, one of the things I enjoy about DC now is uh, when you take one of the earlier integrated neighborhoods of Georgetown, and then now it's one of the places that is one of probably our least integrated neighborhoods because of socioeconomics and you know how it's really moved. Um, but then we also have some of those tiny houses. And one of, the, one of the things I've told my niece and nephew, and I'm hoping I'm not lying to them, but you know, I could be, whatever. Um, <laughs> There's this one eight-foot house, and you know, so the story I've given to them, and if, if it's true, great, and if it's not, it's still a wonderful story, that you know, somebody who was a craftsman saved up some money, got that chunk of land, and they said, well, what do you want with this piece of land? Well, he already had the two walls of the building on the side, and he built one in front and one in back, and he had a house. <laughs> so that's the kind of story that I would give to them, but can you talk you know, a little bit about Georgetown. You know, we were talking about the Jesuits and their $20 million that they made on their sale, which was uh, of expediency rather than of uh, ethics. No. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> it would be $20 million in, 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 in today's money. You know, <clears throat> it, it's very difficult, at least for me, to, 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 to to question people's motives. When one says something, I generally uh, I, I take them at it. 
And in this case, you know, it, it becomes uh, two questions. One was that did, did people who want to end slavery want to end it for, for economic reasons, moral reasons, or what? And the Jesuits made a decision, and they made the decision that they were going to lose the slaves. Uh, now, the big question was, at Rome, there were certain people there who were anti-slavery. They weren't American. They didn't live here. But, but, but by, by human nature, they thought that slavery was wrong. And there had been many Europeans throughout, you know, going back to the Enlightenment and others who saw slavery wrong. So the Jesuits had that, uh, uh, that complex. At the same time, they wanted to save uh, 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 the church, uh, 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 save the Jesuits. You know, when America is founded, uh, 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 a certain, certain early people said this. They said, we don't like slavery, but in order to preserve slavery, democracy is necessary. Now, it seems crazy, doesn't it? But that was said even to, of historians even now. Some will say that. Some very enlightened. Uh, uh, American democracy would not have been the same had not it been found. Now, we never gave it the chance to find out if that were the case. So there are all of these contradictions that exist. They exist society. They, they exist philosophically. You mentioned today, philosophically, it, it is unconscionable to me that we live in a city. The gentleman talk about uh, black history. I, 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 but it's much deeper than that, because it's, it's unconscionable to me that we can live in a city where we see all of this stuff going up at the same time as we put people out in the street and we deny it. So you see, there are all these, the, 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 these constructs. So they're not just white, that they're not black. We see buildings going up all, all the time. Georgetown, and people at Georgetown take great love in the fact that they were the first. Or they, but the fact is that many people wouldn't have left Georgetown because it was segregated, because they could not go into uh, uh, schools. If you lived in Georgetown at 37th Street, you had to walk all the way to Dunbar. You did not have inner housing inside. So there are all these contradictions that make places uh, uh, change. So the Jesuits are probably no different than anyone else. They conflicted uh, 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 with these ideas. Were they wrong? Absolutely. But they were conflicted and they probably thought what they were doing was right. No different than what Lee may have thought that he was doing. But we know absolutely is wrong. We, we can see it now. The legacy we saw in the Washington Post today, a 25-year-old man, college educated, but who now is preaching Klan. So the constitution exists, and so our job is to is, is try to weed through it, and especially in a, in a city like we live in now, because regardless of what I be, I've been here a long time, and what has struck me about this city is that there are so many opportunities to learn so much. You don't have to have money. All you got to do is go to a museum. All you have to do is walk around. You can come into the, and I come from a, you know, a, a pretty poor family, but you can look. And so the chance to look at those contradictions are, are, are all over us. And, we, and so to, ha to have a museum like this is a phenomenal uh, uh, thing, regardless of what, of, of, of what the barriers and things may be. We have the opportunity to grab something and to understand history and to teach our children. It is, it is in that sense, it is a bright moment for a city that I don't think has all that many bright directions going on right now. These two last questions, please. Can you ask the, ask the questions and then we'll respond. Okay, I have two points. One is uh, my wife and I visited this uh, plantation in Louisiana dedicated to slavery. I don't know if you've been there or not. And uh, they had, just as a point, they had recordings of people that were slaves. And these recordings were made by the uh, one of the federal projects during WBA. the Depression, mm -hmm. and you were talking about having actors. Mm -hmm. Are you going to use those same kind of recordings? Yes, we are. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and we, we, we're very selective, and you'll hear a cross-section of experiences of the enslaved. But just so you know, we also do the same for, thing for the transatlantic slave trade. We found some powerful quotes, and you will find that the quotes are of enslaved Africans <coughs> and European observers of the trade. So we've included everybody, yeah. Okay, but my question is this. When I uh, listen, hear about the American Indian Museum, uh, they said uh, the purpose of uh, the American Indian Museum was to prove that those people are still here and they're still moving ahead and you know making things better. If there was a one-liner to summarize the African American Museum, which sounds like it's gonna be dynamite, what, what one-liner I mean, how would you, you know, what, how would you put that? 
You want me to? Do you want to? We can all. Uh, we'll do both. Do one. Okay. And John. And John. Uh-huh. Yeah. For me, it would be um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture looks at the American story through the African American lens and brings together the collective story, the inclusive story, a story of the harsh realities of slavery in America for this particular exhibit, and the resistance and the resilience and the humanity even under the most inhumane conditions. (laughs) Sir, last question. Yes, well, uh, hopefully I can get two in. First question, you, you piqued my interest when you talked about the idea that you might look at slavery in Africa and talk about that. And I wonder if you could maybe go into a little bit about how you address what is a potentially exciting topic. And then uh, second, uh, you know, I, I'm somebody who's interested in the Civil War. And one of the things that I've often heard people talk about is this idea of wage slavery and how poor whites were oppressed. And I'm wondering if you do any comparison or juxtapose, you know, juxtapose or whatever to try to give people an insight into exactly what was the difference between being, say, an African American and a, and a white person and maybe give people an idea of just how different those experiences are. Because for some people, you know, they posit that for certain groups, there wasn't that much of a difference, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Do you want to begin? Well, anyone. So um, you talk about, I think you mentioned during the antebellum period about poor whites, but we um, start from the colonial period, colonial North America, and we talk about the fluidity of status, and we talk about the development of slavery, and we talk about the development of slavery through laws, and we also discuss how those laws came about um, and what was going on socially, as well as about Africans in colonial North America um, (coughs) being engaged with whites, whether it's through labor, through leisure, um, and other means. And so we break down how, at some point, the law starts to make the distinctions. But we do talk about um, poor whites, yeoman farmers, planter elite, enslaved Africans, and free blacks. So we try and lay out the foundation of the many different statuses of people and what that means. Do we differentiate, between, do, do we differentiate between slavery in Africa and slavery in the Americas? Yes, we do. So from the outset, we do talk about what slavery was like in Africa and make the distinction once we get to the transatlantic slave trade about how it is more commercialized and racialized. And we talk about what old world slavery was like versus what new world slavery is like. So we make those distinctions. Um, You ask about the early period and um, slavery in Africa as well. And we also bring that into the context of the discussion about Africans being involved in the slave trade. So all of that will be in there. Nancy, I'm sorry, I cut you off. That's okay. I think one question you were asking is, would people see the difference between quote unquote wage slavery and slavery (laughs) in the exhibit? And you can't go through the exhibit without actually feeling, seeing people being bought and sold. So I don't think they'll be, the definitions are there and are very clear. And we also look at industrialization in the North because we look at um, cotton and really how cotton is the driver of not just you know, southern economy, but of the national economy, and also the nation's expansion. So we bring in some of what's going on across the nation. It's not just a localized history. Right. Any final comments from my members? I just wanted to speak, because that is such a profound, important question, because many, shall we say, neo-Confederates these days use, r- r- resume that language that, that we actually got from many Confederates about wage slavery. Uh, and there's certainly plenty of cases, obviously, in American history and elsewhere of uh, profound oppression of, uh, of, of people who are not of color uh, associated with industrialization, and in fact, the sort of production side of, uh, and the milling side and so forth of, of the cotton economy and so forth. But the difference is, I mean, this is what Orlando Patterson and many other historians keep on reminding us, that uh, 
uh, the, the white working class was systematically subject to both you know, structural and physical <laughs> violence because at times they withdrew consent and, and fought back. But the entire chattel slavery system is predicated on an increasingly uh, racialized idea that any person of color can at any moment be subject to loss of life, to, to torture, to, 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 to being torn apart, to having their families torn apart, and so forth. And that the very definition of what humanity comes to mean in the dominant American vision is actually predicated on a kind of contrast with, with blackness. And, and those are the staggering crimes. And we're talking about the continuities that we see in this city, whether or not we're talking or elsewhere in, you know, in the United <laughs> States, uh, 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 whether or not we're looking at homelessness, whether or not we're looking at mass incarceration uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uncontrolled violence against especially young men of color. And there are direct continuities, that particular structure that we are still trying to exorcise from this polity. And the museum is so vital at the very symbolic heart of the city on the grounds, no less, or at least the former grounds of the Washington Monument, we are holding up, as Mary keeps on saying, a new lens uh, to take apart that nonsensical, idiotic, and horrific uh, contrast between, quote, full humanity and blackness. And that is the most, I think, sacred mission that all of us are engaged in. So thank you for the question. Marie? Yes, uh, thank you. And, and in light of all those questions, I'd like to invite uh, all of you who, who are willing to come to Georgetown uh, next week. We're going to have uh, on uh, 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 April 19th, Edward Baptiste. And he's written a wonderful book. It's called The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. And it, 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 it goes into just what I uh, said. It, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thesis on how uh, uh, slavery was the foundation of America. So slavery was not just a southern institution, but northern institution profited for it and went on. And then, uh, so that's April 19th, if you can go to the Georgetown website. Then April 24th, another uh, remarkable speaker, Dr. Craig Wilder, and he wrote this uh, book, Ebony and Ivy. And notice I say Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American University. And he'll speak there. So uh, the first uh, at 7 o'clock on April 19th, the second, uh, April 21st at uh, 12.30. And uh, all uh, my guests. Okay. He'll be there. John will be there. No, David will be there. Oh, they are, oh, and 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 the uh, archivist will be speaking at another event mm -hmm. uh, that night on the 200th anniversary of Georgetown, uh, seven o'clock. So come and see the archivist uh, again, also. Please join me in thanking this wonderful <laughs> panel. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Group, group photo. Group okay, photo let me request. Oh, we'll take this off in a minute. Uh, uh, you, are, you are collecting slave ships, too. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. presentation. Uh, uh, Marcus Reddick was mine. I hope it's not a Oh, he was my uh, teacher. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Marcus Reddick like was your professor? He was my professor. He recruited me to study history. Yeah. Stay there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait. She's taking a camera. He's the reason I study history. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, that's been. Thank I feel you. like a Keebler elf next to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. It's good, powerful. It's rich. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so good much for coming. Good to see you. I'm going to ask you a favor. No. What's your last okay. name? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Let's get together. Oh, you're ready to? Okay. Bill, Bill's wife. No, no, no. This is Dr. Okay. Daughter, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, you did, you did. The daughter. Thank you. Please. Hello. How are you? It's a nice, nice to meet you as well. Yeah. We can. We can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I do want yes, to know, yes, yes. but I, I haven't touched base. All right, thank you. Yeah. But that one doesn't have. I look forward to it. Thank you. Take it's got, it off. It's got, it, yeah, it's got, Thank yeah. You. Let me give you a good one, though. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just email me, John. Okay. Okay. Hey, man, how you doing? You email me and remind me, because I'm, I'm leaving. How you doing?